Hi, this is Greg Thomas, and welcome to the Welsh American Channel. Americans of Welsh descent had a profound influence leading up to the American Revolution, including the authorship of the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson and the large number of Welsh Americans who signed the Declaration. Eventually, negotiations between the American patriots and the British broke down and a revolutionary war was declared. Once again, several Americans of Welsh descent stepped up to the plate to serve as leaders. Some became leading military leaders during the war. In this video, we will focus on one physically tough and commanding personality. He was Brigadier General Daniel Morgan. He stood six feet tall and weighed over 200 pounds at a time when most men were at least six inches shorter. One individual proclaimed that he was, quote, built like a brickyard with arms like tree trunks, end of quote. American General Nathaniel Green once said about him, quote, great generals are scarce. There are few Morgans, end of quote. Daniel Morgan, as a brigadier general in the American Revolutionary War, was one of the Continental Army's most valuable tacticians and commander of several of the most successful rifle corps of the War for American Independence. Morgan's most famous victory was defeating Colonel Bannister Tarleton's British Legion. At the Battle of Cowpens in January of 1781, by implementing tactics that successfully combined state militias, continental regulars, and cavalry units. As you will see, Morgan was one tough Welsh American. He is considered by many historians to be the most successful field leader of the American Revolution. Born on July 6, 1736, Daniel Morgan was the fifth child of James and Eleanor Lloyd Morgan. All four of his grandparents were Welsh Quaker immigrants who lived in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Morgan's parents also originated from Pennsylvania and then later moved to New Jersey together. Morgan's father was an iron master. Morgan is believed to have been born in Lebanon Township, Hunterton County, New Jersey. He left home about 1753 after a bitter argument with his father. Morgan was reluctant to talk about his past, never speaking of his family nor of where he was born. Daniel supposedly had a brother whom he visited once shortly after returning from the Battle of Saratoga in 1777. Eventually crossing into Pennsylvania, Morgan initially worked around Carlisle before moving down the Great Wagon Road to Charlestown, Virginia. A rugged drinker, gambler and fighter, he worked clearing land, running a sawmill, and eventually as a teamster. In little more than two years, he saved enough to buy his own team. With multiple extra wagons, this operation quickly expanded into a thriving business. At the beginning of the French and Indian War, Morgan found employment as a teamster for the British Army. In 1755, he and his cousin Daniel Boone took part in Major General Edward Braddock's failed campaign against Fort Duquesne now Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which ended in a stunning British defeat at the Battle of the Maangahela. Braddock died of wounds four days after the battle. Morgan later referred to himself as the Old Wagoneer. After the retreat from Fort Duquesne, Morgan encountered difficulty when taking supplies to Fort Chiswell, Virginia in the spring of 1756. He irritated a British lieutenant and then Morgan was made angry when an officer struck him with the flat of his sword. In response, Morgan knocked the lieutenant out with one single punch. Being court-martialed, Morgan was sentenced to 500 lashes. Many individuals did not even survive this cruel beating or the infection that often followed. But Morgan did. Late in life, he joked that the drummer lost count and only whipped him 499 times. He developed a hatred for the British Army. Twenty years later, 
When the Revolutionary War breaks out, guess whose side Morgan's going to be on? Later, when he led his own troops, he banned flogging. In 1757, Morgan joined a Colonial Ranger unit serving under George Washington's Virginia Regiment. Morgan was badly injured while returning to Winchester, Virginia from Fort Edward, New York. As he approached Hanging Rock, Virginia, now West Virginia, he was struck in the neck during a Native American ambush. A bullet knocked out several teeth before exiting his left cheek. If you look closely at later paintings or statues of Morgan, you will see the scar in the left side of his face. In 1764, he took a wife, Abigail Curry Morgan, and they had two daughters, Nancy and Betsy. Abigail was eight years younger than Daniel and would teach him how to read and how to write. Her religious influence would also have a positive effect on her husband. Sometime after the French and Indian War, he purchased a farm between Winchester and Battletown. By 1775, he was very prosperous. That year, he served in Dunmore's War, taking part in raids on Shawnee villages in the Ohio country. After the Revolutionary War began with the Battles of Lexington and Concord on April 19, 1775, the Continental Congress created the Continental Army in June of 1775. They called for the formation of 10 rifle companies from the middle colonies to support the siege of Boston. And in late June of 1775, the state of Virginia agreed to send two. Morgan was chosen by unanimous vote by the committee of Frederick County to form one of these companies and become its commander. Morgan recruited 96 men in only 10 days and assembled them at Winchester on July 14th. This was even larger than the authorized strength of a rifle unit. His company of marksmen were nicknamed Morgan's Riflemen. The long rifles used were more accurate and had a longer range than other firearms at the time, 300 yards compared to only 80 for standard smoothbore muskets. But they took much longer to load. Morgan often used his marksmen as snipers, shooting mostly British officers who thought they were out of range. Sometimes they killed 10 British officers in a day. The Continental Congress authorized the invasion of Canada. Colonel Benedict Arnold convinced General Washington to start an eastern offensive at Quebec in support of American Major General Richard Montgomery's invasion. Washington agreed to dispatch three companies from his forces at Boston, provided they agreed. Morgan's company was one of them. The British overcame the attack in Quebec and the Americans had to surrender. Morgan thus became one of 372 men captured and he remained a prisoner of war until he was exchanged in January of 1777. When he rejoined Washington early in 1777, Morgan was surprised to learn that he had been promoted to colonel for his bravery at Quebec. He was ordered to raise and command a new infantry unit, the 11th Virginia Regiment of the Continental Line. On June 13, 1777, Morgan was given command of the Provisional Rifle Corps, a light infantry force of 500 riflemen chosen from the Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia regiments of the Continental Army. Many were from his own 11th Regiment, including his friend Captain Gabriel Long and Long's best snipers. Washington sent them to harass British General William Howe's rear guard, and Morgan did so during their entire withdrawal across New Jersey. A detachment of Morgan's regiment, commanded by Morgan, was reassigned to the Army's Northern Department, and on August 30th, he joined General Horatio Gates to aid in resisting British General Burgoyne's offensive. Morgan led his regiment with the added support of the New Hampshire Infantry as the advanced troops to the main forces. On September 19th at Freeman's Farm, which is the first battle of Saratoga, 
They ran into the advance troops of General Simon Fraser's wing of Burgoyne's force. Every officer in the British advance party died in the first exchange and the advance guard retreated. For the rest of the afternoon, American fire held the British in check, but repeated American charges were expelled by British bayonets. Burgoyne's next offensive resulted in the Battle of Bemis Heights, also known as the Second Battle of Saratoga on October 7th. Morgan was assigned command of the left or western flank of the American position. Daniel Morgan's sharpshooters were ordered to specifically shoot British officers and their Native American guides in order to cause maximum confusion and disorder among the British troops. Morgan's Virginia sharpshooters got the British light infantry trapped in a crossfire. British General Fraser was trying to rally them, encouraging his men to hold their positions when American General Benedict Arnold arrived. One of Morgan's sharpshooters shot and killed British General Simon Fraser. That night, the British forces withdrew to the village of Saratoga, New York. On October 17th, Burgoyne surrendered his troops under the Convention of Saratoga, which provided for the return of his men to Great Britain on condition that they would not serve again in North America during the war. After Saratoga, Morgan's unit rejoined Washington's main army near Philadelphia. Throughout 1778, he hit British columns and supply lines in New Jersey, but was not involved in any major battles. He had never been politically active, nor had he cultivated a relationship with Congress. As a result, he was repeatedly passed over for promotion to brigadier. Congress favored men with less combat experience, but better political connections. Besides this frustration, his legs and back aggravated him from the abuse taken during the Quebec expedition. He was finally allowed to gracefully resign by General Washington on June 30th, 1779, and returned home to Winchester. In June of 1780, he was urged to re-enter the service by General Gates, but declined. But after Gates' disaster at the Battle of Camden, Morgan put all other considerations aside and went to join the Southern Campaign of the American forces at Hillsboro, North Carolina. Meeting Gates at Hillsboro, Morgan was given command of the Light Infantry Corps on October 2nd. At last, on October 13, 1780, Morgan received his promotion to Brigadier General. Serving under Department Commander Nathaniel Green, Morgan was given command of about 600 men along with the job of harassing the enemy in the back country of South Carolina while avoiding a direct battle. Morgan decided to disobey orders and provoke a battle at Cowpens, South Carolina. On the morning of January 17, 1781, he met British General Bannister Tarleton, whose troops were supplemented with light infantry from several regiments of regulars. Morgan had been joined by militia forces under Andrew Pickens and William Washington's dragoons. Morgan's plan took advantage of Tarleton's tendency for quick action and his disdain for the American militia, as well as the longer range and accuracy of his Virginia riflemen. The marksmen were positioned to the front, followed by the militia with the regulars at the hilltop. The first two units were to withdraw, pretending a retreat as soon as they were seriously threatened, but after inflicting some damage on the British. Morgan knew this would invite a premature charge from the British. As the British forces approached, the retreated Americans, with their backs turned to the British, reloaded their muskets. When the British got close to the Americans, they turned and fired at point-blank range. In less than an hour, Tarleton's 1,076 men suffered 110 killed and 830 captured. 
200 British prisoners of war were wounded. The British Legion, among the best units of Cornwallis's army, was effectively useless. Cornwallis had not only lost Charlton's legion, but also his light infantry, losses that limited his speed of reaction for the rest of the campaign. Cowpens was a surprising victory and a turning point that affected the psychology of the entire war. As it was, the Americans were encouraged to fight further and the Loyalist and British were demoralized. Furthermore, its strategic result, the destruction of an important part of the British Army in the South, was crucial toward ending the war. The Battle of Cowpens began an unbroken chain of consequences that led to the British surrender in Yorktown, Virginia in October of 1781. For his bold actions, Virginia gave Morgan land and an estate that had been abandoned by a Tory. The damp and chill of the campaign had aggravated his sciatica to the point that he was in constant pain. And on February 10th, he returned to his Virginia farm. Morgan resigned his commission after serving six and a half years and at age 46 returned home to Frederick County. He turned his attention to investing in land rather than simply clearing it and eventually built an estate of more than 250,000 acres. He built a new house near Winchester, Virginia named Saratoga after his victory in New York. The Congress awarded him a gold medal in 1790 to commemorate his victory at Cowpens. In 1794, he was briefly recalled to national service to help suppress the Whiskey Rebellion, and the same year he was promoted to Major General. The Whiskey Rebellion was a violent tax protest in the United States beginning in 1791. It was the first tax imposed on a domestic product by the newly formed federal government under George Washington. Serving under General Light Horse Harry Lee, Morgan led one wing of the militia into western Pennsylvania. The massive show of force brought an end to the protest without a shot being fired. After the uprising had been suppressed, Morgan commanded the remnant of the army that remained until 1795 in Pennsylvania, some 1,200 militiamen, one of whom was an American of Welsh descent that we will explore in the future, named Meriwether Lewis. As he became older, he became more religious due to the influence of his wife. He stated, quote, Where you have no religion you are sure to have no government. For as religion disappears, anarchy takes place and fixes a complete hell on earth till religion returns. End of quote. A member of the Federalist Party, Morgan twice ran for the United States House of Representatives, winning election to the House in 1796. He retired from Congress in 1799 and he died at his daughter's home in Winchester on July 6, 1802, at aged 67. He was originally buried at the Old Stone Presbyterian Church graveyard. The body was moved to Mount Hebron Cemetery in Winchester, Virginia, after the American Civil War. His wife Abigail died in 1816 and was buried in Logan County, Kentucky. In his honor, numerous American counties, streets, and cities are named after him. A number of statues and Fort Morgan at the mouth of Mobile Bay, Alabama is named in his honor. In 1973, his home, Saratoga, was declared a National Historic Landmark. Rough and dynamic Daniel Morgan, a successful military leader of Welsh descent, served his nation with honor and commitment. Like many revolutionaries, he's mostly forgotten by today's generation, but recorded history will never forget his legacy and bravery. 
The Daniel Morgan Monument in Winchester, Virginia was dedicated in 2005. At the foot of the statue is a brass plaque that simply reads, Fought everywhere, was beaten nowhere. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel or give us a like and please feel free to make any comments below. If you'd like to see more biographies of leading Americans of Welsh descent, give us a like. And if you have an individual you would like us to showcase, let me know in the comments below. This is Greg Thomas saying Hoylam Nower. Bye for now.